Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. We recently did a video fact-checking YouTube on their little climate science flag that they've been putting on all of our videos. And today I'd like to do a similar fact-check on Facebook and their Science Center. So as I did with YouTube, I'm just going to walk through the PowerPoint in the old-fashioned way. So here we go. This is called Fact-Checking Facebook's Climate Science Center. So for the overview, uh, Facebook has opened a Climate Science Info Center. There's a pop-up link on this site that pops up on most climate science information on Facebook posts. And this PowerPoint presentation will fact-check Facebook's climate and energy claims. So, Here's a little food for thought as we get started. Facebook does not reveal its carbon footprint or yours while posting. Facebook misleads the public on the scientific consensus, the cost of renewables, the state of polar bears, on wildfires and droughts, and the causes of global warming. Facebook does not transparently state its conflicts of interest in promoting climate alarmism to maintain its share value and perceived clean tech status and ESG status for investors. So first let's have a little bit of background. The United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, UNPRI, is an organization, a group of about a thousand signatories. It's a transnational, unelected, unaccountable organization. And it's made up mostly of pension funds, institutional investors, and they have about uh, 90 trillion dollars in assets under management. And for them, climate change is its highest priority ESG issue facing investors. The PRI is working to help investors protect portfolios from risks and to expose them to opportunities in the shift to a low-carbon global economy. So that's a pretty loaded agenda right there with a lot of money behind it. And guess what? Al Gore is their guru on fiduciary duty. Fiduciary duty in the 21st century, from legal case to regulatory clarification around ESG. Well, I wonder what he's going to be promoting. Now, you may have also noticed in the world of corporate endeavors, there's been kind of a shift from assessing how the company is doing financially, what the shareholder value and return is on investment, to what they call ESG. This is environment, social, and governments, governance. This is what um, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy calls Woke Inc. And it's what um, Steve Sukup calls the dictatorship of woke capital. So let's have a look at what the UNPRI promotes. When you sign on to this voluntary UNPRI, you're signing on to six principles for responsible investment. So these were developed by investors for investors and in implementing them the signatories contribute to developing more sustainable global financial system. Um, and now this was a screenshot taken a couple of years ago so the numbers have changed. They have more than 1800 signatories from over 50 countries representing 70 trillion US dollars in uh, assets under management. So principle one, we will incorporate ESG issues into investment analysis and decision-making processes. Principle two, we will be active owners and incorporate ESG issues into our ownership policies and practices. Principle three, we will seek appropriate disclosure on ESG issues by the entities in which we invest. Principle four, we will promote acceptance and implementations of the principles within the investment industry. Principle five, we will work together to enhance our effectiveness in implementing the principles. And principle six, we will each report on our activities and progress toward implementing the principles. So this is an unelected, unaccountable group of people who are actively changing policies worldwide. 
And it's important to know that things changed quite a bit since the 1970s. I think reading these two books would give people quite a bit of insight on what's happened in markets and investments. The first one is by Peter Drucker, who is a very well-known management consultant. Um, it's called The Unseen Revolution, How Pension Fund Socialism Came to America. And um, so Drucker here is talking about the fact that pension funds in the 1970s started buying uh, shares in corporate entities to the point where they pretty much own them. So unions, effectively, union pension funds own corporate America now. So you can see that there is an ebb and flow between these two things. For instance, if your union pension fund invested in renewables, they would tell you that and then you would probably vote for a party that was going to support renewables, whether or not you knew they were of any uh, value to the power grid. Uh, it just would make sense, right? So it creates a whole shift in the um, voter decision-making process and a whole shift in corporate America because union pension funds are very powerful, financially powerful. Um, and tax-free, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> and the other one is called Unseen Power, How Mutual Funds Threaten the Political and em Economic Wealth of Nations by Canadian Adam Harms. And this is a very interesting book because some of these mutual and hedge funds now have so much money, they actually can sink a region or economy of a country, as in, um, I think it was the 1980s, uh, George Soros did such a deal with um, the British pound um, and uh, cost British taxpayers a lot of money. It was perfectly legal what he did, but it, if you go back in history and look up that incident, you'll find that it, uh, it just shows how powerful these uh, financial institutions have become. And, uh, you know, the little guy like you or me really you know, we wouldn't ordinarily rely on our elected representatives to help us out, but they're also often um, attached to or lobbied by these very large organizations. Or, say for instance, these very large financial institutions can go to banks or corporations and say, do as we want you to do, or we'll pull our investment. Um, so, you know, if you're the CEO of a company, uh, there's not a lot of jobs for CEOs, so usually they go along with it and usually right after that they get a bonus. <laughs> anyway, so unions invested in corporate America, pension funds and hedge and mutual funds drive markets today. Uh, on top of this, uh, multi-billion dollar philanthropies fund academia and ENGOs, environmental groups, pushing for global cap and trade and new markets like EVs, renewables, and those are all reliant on climate policies. And you can see here that Climate Works has been funding these groups for like $600 million a year. Many of these groups are charities, so the money is tax-free, and many times they also match it with donations from their uh, supporters, which are also tax-free. So it's also draining the tax pool. At the same time, it's advocating for subsidized wind and solar and we'll see how this plays into the Facebook story as we now get into their Science Center. Again, I mentioned earlier, Steve Sukup has noted that ESG stocks, those are the environment, social and governance stocks, and high tech pretty much overlap. So it looks like ESG as a standard was basically developed for the high tech industry to make it into a, a stock market star. So most ESG requirements are climate or nature related, and this is why climate dissent is censored or fact-checked on social media. That's our view. So fact-checking Facebook's Climate Science Center. So we see here a, a report from DW, Facebook launches climate project to tackle misinformation. So after coming under fire for not doing enough to stop climate myths from spreading on its site, Facebook will now add info labels to climate change posts and direct users to a fact-checked website. But is it enough? 
And I say, is it accurate? Let's look. So here's a post that was on our Facebook and you can see all of a sudden at the bottom there's this little flag from Facebook saying, see how the average temperature in your area is changing. Okay, let's go see. You click on it and uh, we get a closer look at that. Explore the climate science info. All right, let's do that. So when you click on the Facebook pop-up link, you end up here on this page and it's actually already tailored to Alberta, which is where I am. The site appears to be tailor-made to take you to your region's data. <laughs> and it says, the average annual temperature in Alberta has increased since 1950. Okay, I don't think I'd argue with that. Now, there's a little eye up in the corner for info, so when you click on that, it takes you to these references, which shows you where they get the information for their graph from. And so it says that the paper they relied on here was by Fan and Van den Duel, 2008, a global monthly land surface air temperature analysis. Okay, let's go see what that paper's about. So this is the peer-reviewed paper that Facebook refers to as its citation for climate data on Alberta. It was published in the uh, Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres, and uh, there it is, Fan and Duel. And so as we're reading down the page, the first thing that we see is that in point six, it says, readers are advised that the resulting temperature data set to be described in this paper was not constructed first and foremost for climate change studies. So it says while the GHCN, that's uh, a name for the uh, Global Historic uh, climate network um, data set. Um, while that component of the data has gone through most quality checks that one would like to see, the CAMS, which is a different data set, um, uh, even though they're much more numerous than the GHCN, is less strictly quality controlled, even though it's quite good. So. Essentially, when we see this, the authors are stating that it should not be used for climate change studies. And further on, in point number 10, it says the analysis of scarce data in mountainous areas requires elevation adjustments, which can be tricky in the absence of observations, that means recorded temperature data. The lapse rate can only be a climatological guess largely ignoring daily and annual cycles, inversions in valleys, etc. Well, yes, you see, Calgary and Alberta are greatly affected by the Rocky Mountain Range, which goes up the west side of the province, particularly southern Alberta. Anything south of Edmonton is extremely affected by what we call the Chinook wind. And this is a phenomenon that's known around the world in other mountainous regions. In Switzerland, it's called the Föhn, F-O-E-H-N. And uh, there's other kinds of nicknames for it around the world. Chinook is a, a native Alberta name, Blackfoot name, meaning snow eater. And so what does it say about Chinook winds in the downtown Marriott Hotel of Calgary? <laughs> it says, that Chinook winds can gain 5.5 degrees Celsius for every thousand feet of descent and can gust in excess of hurricane force. Radical temperature changes as much as 30 degrees can occur in just a few hours. And every Calgarian, every Southern Albertan can tell you that that's exactly so. And this is why they're telling us that this particular data set is not reliable because this kind of information is not available in the historic record. Now you might say, okay, well, you're talking about Facebook, like this is a big company. What are you guys at Friends of Science talking about? I like, who are you guys? Well, what does Friends of Science know about Alberta's climate that Facebook does not know? 
Our headquarters are here in Alberta. We've been assessing IPCC reports, those are the UN climate reports, since 2002. And Facebook was only established in 2005, and at the beginning, climate change was nothing that they were concerned about. We also wrote a report called Facts versus Fortune Telling, which rebuts Dr. Catherine Hayhoe's misinformed view of Alberta's climate future. So please read it and then you'll see how we would know more about Alberta's climate than Facebook would. So Facebook's selected graph does meet the World Meteorological Organization's climate standard of a 30-year period. So usually when you're looking to see if there's a change in climate, you evaluate it based on 30-year periods because anything shorter might just be a, a short-term anomaly. But this is one of the fundamental standards of the WMO. So over 30 years, if we look at that graph, yes, it does show a rise in temperature. Yes, it begins in 1950. That's when human-caused warming theory advocates say that human causation became evident. But begins in 1950, which had been a dip to a cooler temperature. So that kind of skews the perception of temperature rise. You know, it's interesting that they didn't use a more contemporary time frame, right? I mean, if it's 30 years, why not use 30 years from 2020 or 2019 and go back and see? because I think the graph would be quite different. And what else is missing is the long-term data. So this is what Alberta looked like in the 1930s. It was a dust bowl. There was almost a decade of baking hot heat. So if you don't have that as part of the uh, comparison to temperatures today, then you're misleading the public. And if we look at the long-term record, it actually shows a decline in temperature trend in the Calgary, Alberta region. So you can look and see. Now, Facebook also puts up more information in their Climate Science Information Center. They start telling us facts about climate change. And these facts from climate researchers correct common misconceptions about global warming and its impact. So the first one is the cause of climate change is widely agreed upon in the scientific community. And they claim at least 97% of published climate experts agree that global warming is real and caused by humans. Well, that's wrong. All of the 97% consensus surveys are flawed. The biggest flaw being the fact that science is not a democracy. It's not about opinion. It's about evidence. That's what matters. So. Then they say, the cost of renewable energy is dropping rapidly. Well, this is irrelevant. The cost of integrating renewables to the power grid and backing them up has increased. The energy return on energy invested in wind and solar is so low that it can't even support basic society. So, you know, let's imagine if it takes you a lot of calories to take a shovel and dig a hole in the ground, uh, where are you going to get those calories back from the food you grow there? Like what happens if you end up just growing weeds? There's not going to be energy, any, any energy return on your digging investment. And so if we put a lot of energy into building wind and solar devices and then developing the farms and integrating them into the grid, if they don't provide equal or more energy than what was used to make them, then the energy return on energy invested is flat or negative. And that's what uh, a study that Dr. Or Professor Michael J. Kelly did uh, for uh, Cambridge. Uh, it shows that the energy return on energy invested from wind and solar is not sufficient to support basic society. So then Facebook directs readers to NASA's website, which also says the scientific consensus, Earth's climate is warming. But most geologists do not agree with the alleged consensus. And if you look at the Holocene period, which is about the past 12,000 years, this graph shows you that, first of all, all the warming trends are the same. 
the cooling trends are rather sharper trends and that we've actually gone into a more cool period. The Roman op optimum, the medieval warm period, were much warmer than today, probably by about two degrees. And you also see on the bottom part of the graph, uh, the red line shows the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and it obviously has nothing to do with the cycles of warming and cooling in the graph at the top. Then Facebook tells us overall polar bear populations are declining because of global warming. Well, that's not what the truth is. Polar bear populations are growing to the extent that some northern villages are at risk, at life-threatening risk. Polar bears survived the Holocene Hipsy Thermal. That was about 8,000 years ago and uh, all the sea ice melted, but they were fine and they lived on to today. And recent global warming is caused by humans, not natural events. Well, that's just simply not true. The sun drives climate change along with the interplay of natural factors like the oceans. This is the evidence of billions of years. Carbon dioxide concentration is a consequence of climate change and only nominally a cause. So you see there's competing view from the geologic earth sciences community and the climate modeling community um, which deals only with the shortest time period, maybe the last 150 years, um, as opposed to the 4.5 billion years that geologists and earth scientists look at. Then uh, they go on to say that too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere harms plant, Earth's plant life. But in fact, life has flourished on Earth with carbon dioxide at 10 to 12,000 parts per million. And the IPCC SREX report, that's a special report on extreme weather, shows there's neither CO2 nor warming is driving extreme weather events. And NASA has also noted that the addition of CO2 in the atmosphere has led to what's called CO2 fertilization, more plant growth, more greenery worldwide. Facebook goes on to say the severity of recent droughts and wildfires is driven by cli changing climate. Well, yes, perhaps some part of a changing climate is that human or natural. They don't distinguish here. But Facebook is located in California. This is a region that historically has suffered from 100 and 200 year droughts. And wildfires are due to human causes and poorly managed fuel loads. Early settlers found California rife with wildfire. And you can see this CAL FIRE graph here on the side showing human caused versus naturally caused. And the causes are equipment, power lines, you know, intercepting uh, lines and causing them to spark. Arson <laughs> is the third highest. Lightning is the fourth highest cause. That's a natural cause. And the rest are all human caused as well. Debris burning, vehicles, camping, uh, playing and smoking. So again, Facebook is misleading the public. Now let's look at sustainability at Facebook. They say, we believe sustainability is about more than operating responsibly. <laughs> it's an opportunity to support the communities we're part of and have a positive impact on the world. Sounds good, eh? So they say that they're leading the way on climate change. And they also say, very boldly, at Facebook, we have achieved net zero emissions. That doesn't mean that they're not emitting. <laughs> And then they say, we believe we can do it with a net zero carbon footprint and that climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we face. Let's see about that. Well, this page shows us that Facebook has a number of data centers and you know what they need? They need a lot of energy. They need electricity 24 seven, uninterruptible. They need lots of cooling and heating, um, especially cooling and uh, that all takes tons and tons of energy. So this is just a practical reality. These are not running on wind and solar. And their focus areas are climate, energy, they show a wind turbine, and water, and a responsible supply chain. Okay. Now, here's a graph from Statista. 
showing that Facebook is a huge energy user. This is probably the size of a small country. How we're helping fight climate change? Well, they show wind turbines, and yet Google engineers say renewable energy won't solve climate change. Now, Google gave these engineers unlimited funds and time to see if they could find a way to come up with a solution using renewables and they found that renewables won't stop climate change and uh, actually I believe their study found that uh, wind and solar can't compete with coal power either. But we don't see this on the front page, do we? And we don't see that Facebook is aware of this. Or if they are, they're not showing that. Now, Facebook says that they're combating misinformation, we're stopping false news from spreading, removing content that violates our principles, and giving people more information so they can decide what to read, trust, and share. So effectively, what they're saying is they're telling people what to read, trust, and share. They're not giving people information that uh, makes allows them to make their own choice. And I can say this personally because we did a video and... Uh, they have shadow banned it. <laughs> so no one can see that video anymore and make their own decision. So in fact, they're actually censoring people. They're actually taking freedom of choice and freedom of thought and freedom of speech away from you. So Facebook is misinforming millions of people on climate, consensus, renewables, polar bears, wildfires, droughts, carbon dioxide, and the impact of human influence on climate change. And in this little bit from CNET, it says, beyond sustainability initiatives, the social network is fighting an ongoing battle to contain the spread of misinformation on a number of topics, including climate change denial. This past year, Facebook launched the Climate Science Information Center, a resource sharing top climate science, which the company says has been visited by more than 60 million people worldwide. So I just showed you that their material is incorrect. And here's the action that they're taking. They put up a little uh, flag that says, this page has repeatedly shared false information. So can we get Facebook to do unto itself? as it's doing to everyone else. And ironically, even though uh, we've just been told that they were fact-checking and providing the facts on climate science, uh, in court, Facebook admitted the truth that fact-checks are really just opinion. And these guys said really just lefty opinions. <laughs> so what are we dealing with here? Well, now we have expanding penalties for individual Facebook accounts. Uh, so now their focus is on reducing viral misinformation. And this program began in late 2016. They want to penalize people for sharing material that Facebook fact checkers say is false, even though those are just opinions of fact checkers, as Facebook admitted in court. Here we go, this is the video I mentioned. Facebook fact-checked this video and shadow banned it. That's my video, I was in it. <laughs> so the crime? In this video, Michelle Sterling, that's me, communications manager for Friends of Science Society, simply read the press release from Clintel, at that time a group of 500 scientists who told the UN there's no climate emergency. The video has over 700,000 views, but cannot be shared on Facebook anymore without the sharing party being penalized. Clearly, the public want to know about dissenting views, but Facebook won't let you know. By contrast, Greta has never been blocked or downgraded. Despite having terrified millions of children worldwide for her I want you to panic statements, in testimony to U.S. Congress on April the 21st, 2021, Greta said there's no science behind her panic statement. It's just a metaphor. And if you'll note, um, Greta is backed by these carbon trading folks over at We Don't Have Time. And I, in, I encourage everyone to read the work of Corey Morningstar, who wrote the book, The Manufacturing of Greta Thunberg. 
Now, she's also got a blog post on the same topic if you don't want to buy the book, but I recommend buying the book, supporting her, because she did tons of research. Very interesting. So, isn't the fact that there's no climate emergency in the public interest? Because Facebook says in their Transparency Center, our commitment to voice, if it's newsworthy and in the public interest, and if we address the public value, the public interest value against the risk of harm, then they think it should be posted. Well, isn't Greta's statement that I want you to panic, which she subsequently claimed is not based on any science, doing harm to children and parents worldwide? Now, here's an item from The Lancet. Climate anxiety in children and young people and their beliefs about government responses to climate change, in which they said respondents from all countries were worried about climate change. 59% were, were very or extremely worried and 84 were at least moderately worried. More than 50% reported each of the following emotions. that They were sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and guilty. More than 45% of respondents said their feelings about climate change negatively affected their daily life and functioning, and many reported a high number of negative thoughts about climate change. That's what we're doing to kids by not having a fulsome debate about climate change. We're scaring the pants off our kids. We're making them hopeless. We're making them feel like they have no future. And I think that's in the public interest, don't you? that this be explored and revealed, discussed and debated in an open, civil manner in the public forum on Facebook. So why is this happening? Well, Facebook is protecting its share value, not your freedom of expression. That's my perspective. So here's a little clip from Bloomberg. This is from 2017, I believe, yes where they're boasting that Apple was the world's 70th largest company a decade ago, then iPhone launched, and so now there, Apple was uh, top of the market. And uh, Facebook was in fourth place. And if you notice, um, Exxon Mobil was in tenth, and Exxon used to be top of the pile. All the oil companies used to be top of the pile. So high-tech companies are presented as clean tech, they attract climate-addled UNPRI signatory investors. They prop up global renewables markets by buying renewable energy certificates to claim that they're 100% renewable. And climate change makes them appear more valuable than they are. All high-tech companies could not exist without fossil fuels. That's the big irony, right? If there's no climate emergency, then Exxon and the other oil companies go back to being number one in market value. And in fact, that's what happened just this spring. Just add an energy crisis and voila, Saudi Aramco becomes the world's most valuable stock as Apple drops. <laughs> and you can see here, it's a sea of red with all of the high-tech companies really suffering in the present um, market conditions for a number of reasons. The energy crisis is certainly one of them and uh, also the fact that the ESG story is falling apart. And sad to know, really, you as a taxpayer, it's sad to know that one of the richest companies in the world runs on taxpayer-funded renewables subsidies. So here we have Investopedia uh, on Meta platform, which is Facebook. And uh, it says, since 2020, Meta has supported its global operations with 100% wind and solar energy. As our footprint grows, it's key that we find strong partners who can help us continue to meet that goal by bringing new re renewable energy to the grid, said Irvi Perk, head of renewable energy at Meta. We're excited to partner with Transalta to make this 200 megawatt project a reality. So that's right here in my backyard. Transelta and Meta announce a 200 megawatt renewable power purchase agreement and launch of the Horizon Hill wind project. Now, we have a, a few reports on our website. One of them is called The True Cost of Wind and Solar in Alberta. 
and it will just blow your mind how much taxpayers are subsidizing the richest companies in the world so that they can boast that they're 100 percent renewable. Now, <clears throat> it says here, can any ESG investor own Facebook? It looks like they got in trouble with their own standards. <clears throat> so it says in 2021, Meta Platforms, formerly Facebook, was number 21 on the Just 100 list, but it dropped down to uh, 712. And this is, uh, they state here, it's fall from grace in the Just 100 is an example of how ESG methodologies remain imperfect. That's true, they're totally subje subjective. Um, Meta's ranking has been adjusted to reflect unique and extraordinary actions that are not adequately captured in the model. So they uh, reviewed Facebook as a place of misinformation, hate speech, and other discriminatory and incendiary content on their platforms. So it looks like Facebook censorship is a ploy to get into the good graces with ESG investors. And yet, as we've shown you, the biggest misinformation on climate comes from Facebook and Meta itself. So imagine propping up a global industry built on misinformation and ESG. So the climate industry is now a $1.5 trillion global industry, which is based on the false notion that carbon dioxide drives from human industry drives climate change, when scientifically the evidence shows that CO2 is not the control knob that can fine tune climate. And there is no empirical evidence showing that carbon dioxide drives climate change from human emissions. There's no empirical study showing that. It's all in the models, simulations. So fortunately for society, it looks like ESG will soon collapse. And this is the viewpoint of Steve Sukup from The Dictatorship of Woke Capital. In his blog, The Politi Political Forum, Sukup writes, based on this and everything else we've seen, read, and surmised over the past year, we're going to make two predictions. First, by the end of the year, that is hard to say. Within the next seven months and 18 days, ESG will more or less collapse. It will end like T.S. Eliot's world, not with a bang, but with a whimper. There will be no announcement, no surrender. No one, aside from us, will declare the end of ESG era or say a prayer over its corpse. It will just fade away. Everyone will move on, and the whole business will fade into the ether like so many investment fads before it. Second. Even as ESG dies an ignominious death, the threat to American business, and especially American capital markets, will continue. It will simply shift slightly, move outside the fisheye lens, take a more subtle, less aggressive tack, and far too many people will experience a false sense of victory and be lulled into a false sense of security by this shift. And that's true because there's a new reporting standard out uh, that's pretty scary, uh, and it's supposed to be international reporting standards. But that's a story for another day. So that's our fact check on Facebook's Climate Science Center. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. I hope that you will help us out by subscribing to our channel. You can subscribe down below. You can leave us a comment or a question. And uh, I'd like to ask you if you would help us go into our 20th year of operation with a small donation. We're asking our viewers if they were just to do donate $20 for our 20th year. If you can donate more, fantastic, but $20 would be very helpful. You can send it by e-transfer, contact at friendsofscience.org. And uh, you can help us out by sharing our information. So um, please subscribe, please share, please donate. And you can also become a member and then you can get the rest of our newsletters which give you insights you won't see in the mainstream media. So thanks a lot for watching this kind of long and detailed presentation. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.